Wisconsin is going back to work. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. This is Rewind, Wisconsin Eyes version of This Week in the Capitol. J.R., before we handicap or talk about some, some races, let's talk about four developments in the Capitol. First, former Assembly Majority Leader Bill Kramer pleads to two misdemeanor sexual mm -hmm. assault charges. Lessons on how the once mighty fall, J.R.? Well, a couple things to take away from this. One, uh, there are some Democrats not happy that he did not have to register as a sex offender or will not have to as registered sex offender under the plea deal. Is that because he copped to misdemeanors? Yep. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, well, as part of the plea deal, um, Brad Schimmel's office handled that case. That might be something you mentioned the last week and half of the oh, campaign. Yeah. Um, two, I mean, if you go back when they elected him majority leader, uh, a lawmaker stood up and said, we can't trust this guy. And it was airing dirty laundry in front of everybody in the entire room. And he got a lot of grief for doing this, but in the end, he was right. That was uh, Capping who said that, who yep. represents a district that's right next to his. Absolutely. So he'd seen his, seen his behavior at a number of events, and he did not represent Republicans well. Thanks, I forgot. Couldn't that. be trusted. Right. Uh, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing there. And the other thing is, I don't know how to say this exactly, but there are lots of bad behavior in the legislature. It has been for a while. This guy, though, just crossed some lines. And okay. people kind of knew about some of this stuff for a while, but... This was way between the the fundraising trip out to D.C. and what he did there, and this this is just kind of like well beyond just you know if you want to call it boys being boys or you know boorish behavior it's by lawmakers, it's way right. beyond that. Right. And so it's just it's sad. I mean, all around, it's sad. I mean, it's sad for the person who had to to be uh, treated like this by Kramer, and that this guy had these problems and couldn't deal with them. Right. Right. And he could get jail time. He hasn't been sentenced yet. Yes. Secondly, Democrats sue to make public tapes of, of uh, Department of Justice training seminars led by Brad Schimmel, the Waukesha County DA, and the Republican candidate for Attorney General. What do they hope to find? Well, if you read the lawsuit, they mention that there may, and I do stress may, Conditional. be sexist or racist comments in there. Now, what are they? They don't detail what they are. It could be bad rumor. It could be a you know, a flyer to try to interject this issue in the race in the last couple of days. Obviously, that's what Republicans think it is. Yeah. But they're hoping to get some kind of tape and show something embarrassing about Brad Schimmel the last couple of days of the campaign. I don't think they'll get their hands on those things the last 11, 11 days now, I think it is. Right. So it's kind of a flyer. We're, in some ways, yes, it's a serious issue. In other ways, it's, it's silly season. We are in the middle of silly season right now in which you have complaints filing left and right. Uh, what was the one about Mary Burke this week? She touted one of her... Investments something in an she ad. owned, a conflict of interest. Yes. That she touted a, uh, something that uh, she owned stock in or something. Now, granted, you may be able to kind of shoehorn set into a statute in some way, shape, or form, but these things are not going to result in jail time or, you know, anything like that or big fines. It's about getting a complaint and file the GAB and trying to embarrass somebody, a one-day hit story, and kind of add to the fodder, if you will. Jerry, let me ask you this. Has the attorney general race turned this nasty because... Uh, most voters still say they don't have enough information on both Brad Schimmel and um, Susan Happ, the Jefferson County DA and Democratic candidate? They're fighting for attention, and that's a big problem is nobody knows who they are, and they, how do you break through the clutter? So to break through the clutter, you're trying to find the other side, and that's what the outside groups are doing. I mean, no, w WMC did something good for Schimmel, which they ran a positive ad to start. Uh, ran that for, like, I think it's been all a week now, but now they're going after Susan Happ, the Committee for Justice and Fairness going after Schimmel, uh, Haps on the air as of today with a positive ad, you know, for herself. Again, features the Harley. Schimmel's got his spot that's been running. So it's, it's just, for them, it's difficult to break through. So how do you break through? You have to go get grab attention, and that's what these negative ads are doing. Oh, by the way, uh, Greater Wisconsin's coming in from what we've seen from the GAB report. So we're going to see this really is going to intensify for the last two weeks of the race. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, okay, th the third thing I want to talk about before we look at some of these specific races. So Speaker Voss and many of his fellow um, uh, caucus members, they announced their agenda for 2015-2016 before the election. But here's my question. Isn't he um, getting out ahead of both Governor Walker and Senate Majority Leader Fitzgerald? Uh, a little bit. The timing was kind of odd. Somebody told me this week, and I'm not quite sure why. But the, the other flip side is it's election time, you want to present a positive vision for going forward. We have an agenda that you can trust. I mean, they talked about generic things. I mean, they talked about Governor Walker's thing. They top, uh, a couple of members, right, talked up the drug testing yeah. for people on public assistance. So right. it's not like they were way out in left field, what they're talking doing, cutting taxes, 
you know, helping businesses, spurring growth. I mean, these are all themes we've heard from both sides. It's what's the speci what are the specifics going to be? And then, you know, of course, they were asked, well, what about banning abortion after 20 weeks? What about right to work? Oh, we're, those aren't on the agenda. But right. you know, they, will they will pop at some point next year. Well, I asked after the press conference whether uh, Senate Majority Leader Fitzgerald had signed on to these, and I was told that um, the Senate Majority Leader was shown a copy of the <laughs> announcements, but nothing beyond that. Well, let's be honest. Those two houses were not on the same page a lot right. this last session. And now what's going to be interesting is let's... For now, just okay, let's say it fits and Voss come back as leaders. Like, things don't change balance wise. Um, you have a, an interesting dynamic that's going to happen in which in the assembly, if Voss maintains a huge majority, the people coming in are more conservative than the ones that they're replacing in some cases, especially like uh, Dean Crawford's district, Steve Castell, who you know, obviously opposed getting rid of Common Core. Yes. Those are, these are some issues going to pop in that caucus. How is he going to manage that thirst for these conservative bills knowing that? The caucus as a whole is more conservative than Wisconsin as a whole. Uh, in the Senate, you know, Fitzgerald's got this issue where Mike Ellis has been either the backstop or to blame or to credit, whatever you want to say, yeah. for these bills that have been, some members haven't liked. Yep. So he's been out orchestrating or, you know, kind of working the angle on what to hold up, what to let through. Yep. Well, there are a half dozen members or less than that in that caucus who had the same issues with these bills, but they don't get the heat. Mike did, and, and the perceptions Mike kind of, you know, that was his thing. He, he enjoyed being part of that game. Yeah. What happens next session if, again, if Republicans come back and control and those four, five, six members had the same, will they stand up and say, wait a second, you know, now I'm going to speak publicly about these issues. I mean, Luther Olson, for example, he's raised issues about Common Core. You know I, th it? I think he's the one most likely to take the mantle of Ellis and kind of raise questions about some of these other priorities. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic. What can they, what can they still get through? I mean, they're I get the impression that some people, some Republicans think, oh, we're going to have free reign to do whatever we want if we come back in control. Right. Maybe not. It might still be a slog on some of these bills to get some things through. That's fascinating. Well, as we speak, Bubba for Burke, mm -hmm. uh, former President Clinton is in Milwaukee right now and uh, stumping for Mary Burke. President Obama comes in, North Division High School next Tuesday. Um, we've had two Michelle Obamas, one President Clinton, and now President Obama. It's all about turnout in Milwaukee, right? Oh, for Burke, yeah. Now, don't forget, uh, Governor Walker's got Christie coming back. So, but Governor Walker said was, I don't need surrogates. I get people wherever I go. I need money. I need help from outside groups. And From the well, RGA? RGA, please send more our way. But with Burke, I mean, yeah, it, if you think about it, Democrats had this issue of drop-off in midterm elections, both white and black voters. Um, in Milwaukee, there is obviously a large African-American community, which... Bill Clinton has certain appeal to. We talked about being the first black president, right? Yep. Uh, Barack Obama has certain appeal to. Uh, what I've heard from people this week is that Bill Clinton is a safer surrogate, if you will, for Mary Burke. He, he is well-respected in the black community. He also has good numbers, generally speaking, with the public at large. Makes sense to have him. Barack Obama's a little bit more of a risk. Yeah. Um, he also has a certain appeal, the African-American community. Would help goose turnout, you would think. But the voters in suburban counties, Waukesha, Ozaki, Waukesha, They'll see those news stories about Barack Obama on Tuesday, and they're going to be motivated as well. So there's kind of a, an upside and downside to Ob Obama coming in for Burke. Well, I'm, and I'm also, also surprised. Is there any hint of Hillary Clinton coming in for Burke? Not yet. Okay. That would be a fascinating. Uh, well, it would be. Fascinating not just of that, but 2016. Future presidential candidate Hillary With trying Scott. to build uh, uh, a relationship if Mary Burke's elected. And Scott Walker, who's been openly critical of Hillary Clinton as a presidential contender, if you will, could be a fascinating dynamic. Okay, those are, those are four. I, I want us to talk about uh, a few specific races. Let's talk about in the 6th U.S. House District, Glenn Grothman versus Mark Harris. Um, former Congressman, current Congressman, retiring Congressman Tom Petra refused to endorse Grothman this week. Um, is that a big deal? No, I mean, not in the context of what's happening because Mark Harris is having a hard time raising money, getting outside groups to come in and help. So Grothman's basically got the stage to himself. Now, Harris went up on TV this week with an ad, his first of the campaign, talks about the role of Glenn Grothman. But it's a Republican-leaning seat, a Republican year. It's just not looking like... It's not a priority a with time. the DNC, is it? No, and if you look at nationally, the DCCC has had a pullback from top recruits to focus on their incumbents. Right. If they're pulling back from top recruits and swing seats, they're not going to take a flyer on a guy in a Republican-leaning seat, Republican year, to maybe make it close. More likely, you talk about 2016, Assuming that the perception is correct that Glorfman is going to win, 2016 you come back and try and hope that Glenn Grothman gives you more fodder his first few years in Congress and go after him then. 
Okay, let's talk about that. There was a, a Democrats hoped that Grothman would put mm -hmm. his foot squarely in his mouth again. Fair to say he has not? He ran a very disciplined campaign. Yep. It's been very well done. He is, you know, now the complaint has been from Mark Harris that Grothman's not out there doing stuff, not out there publicly, but, you know, Grothman's run a smart campaign so far. Uh, let's look at two uh, state uh, state senate races. 19th district, uh, Penny Bernard Schaefer, Democrat, state representative versus former state representative Roger Roth. Can a Democrat win a seat that Ellis, the, uh, the Senate president, held for 32 years, Jr.? If you look in the last, in 2012, Obama and Romney were split, uh, were 12 votes apart in that district. 12? 12. 1, 2. Yes. But that's a presidential year. This is now a midterm election, Democrat turn we down. Uh, Governor Walker does very well in the Fox Valley. There's a perception that he will help boost turnout there and help Roger Roth. Roger, by the way, has been on TV with several ads. Penny's been being attacked by WMC. The Republicans feel pretty good about that seat right now because they think their polling shows that he's at or across the finish line, you know, 50% of okay. what they're seeing because it, they've just about spent her at this point. You know, they've been up on the air and pounding her and that's, that doesn't help. Okay. Trying to win a seat. No, uh, 17 district, Democrat Pat uh, Baumhack versus uh, State Representative Howard Markline. That's for the Schultz open seat. Um, now, I've heard you say that that district at top of the ticket is a Democratic district, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And that's the reason that WMC is uh, uh, dropping so many ads on Pat's head? Well, it's, gonna, it's to help, it's to find Pat Baumhack where he can find himself. Um, now, I've heard from Republicans, they felt pretty good about that seat. They weren't like, seeing it was done a couple weeks ago. They felt good because WMC was unanswered. Um, now, Greater Wisconsin has come in with his first ad going after Howard Markline, saying he toes the party line, the Republican party line. He's voted to cut education funding, all these things he votes. The, um, kind of the independent voice he talks about being in his ad isn't mm -hmm. really true when he's in Madison. And then now Bomb Bombhack has his own mail, uh, uh, radio ad up, and the Democratic Party has a mailer out touting Dale Schultz saying nice things about Bombhack. Yes. Uh, and not such nice things about Howard Markline. So, right. you know, the hard thing for Bonac is this. WMC has hurt him with their attack ads. Can the last week and a half, can the Greater Wisconsin coming in and Baumhap's message about Dale Schultz, can that help to stem that tide? It doesn't look great for him right now, but it's still a week and a half away, maybe. Uh, but I would say Markline has a little bit of an edge right now. Okay. Uh, in central Wisconsin, Assembly District 70, the rematch mm -hmm. between Democratic Democratic Rep uh, Amy Sue Vruink and Nancy Vandermeer. I'm struck by Amy Sue's district is uh, more than 100 miles long. Mm -hmm. I looked it up. She had to open up two campaign offices, and she Amy Sue only won by 144 votes two years ago. Democrats tell me they are most worried about her. Mm -hmm. fair, fair assessment? Yes. Uh, what Republicans did in redrawing that district a couple of years ago was they took it and made it go south to Toma, pick up all new territory, because Amy Sue has a reputation for being a hard worker. Yeah. Right? made her defend all this new territory. She pulled it off in 2012 with Democratic turnout boosted by the president. Uh, now it's a little bit different situation. They feel better about it. Uh, Republic Democrats will tell you, yeah, it's a dogfight race. It's gonna be narrow. Republicans are starting to feel pretty good that they think they have Amy Sue for the final time. Remember, she had flirted the job of the Walker administration yes. uh, last year. And Came close taking to taking it, it. yep. Um, Republicans are trying to pick her off one way or another. They may have her this time. It's still a dog fight, but Republicans feel decent about that seat as we sit it right now. And another fascinating race in central Wisconsin, 72nd Assembly District, uh, Republican Rep Scott Krug versus Democrat Dana Duncan. Duncan, a lawyer, mm -hmm. president of the Port Edwards School Board, he's all out uh, anti-Act 10. Mm -hmm. Now this is fascinating. This is a fascinating race to me. Um, he also uh, he also says, Krug, you broke your 2010 yes. pledge and not take per diems. When I interviewed Krug on this, he said, I didn't take him in the 2011-2012. I took him in 13-14 because I figured out how often I had to be in Madison to be productive for my district. And I also not only kept Skyward, remember that in mm -hmm. the last budget fight, but now they've opened Skyward, a brand new headquarters. But um, Krug only won by 109 votes two years ago. You your take get, on that race? His other promise was only served two terms. Now he's running for a third. Thank you. Uh, so Dana Duncan is hitting him on that radio. What's interesting is the outside groups, Republican side are hitting Dana Duncan because, you know, he defended a child molester and all these kind. you know, going picking through his legal career, hard-hitting mail piece. There's radio up there. So it's, there's an opportunity for Democrats in that district. It's not a great one for them, but it's decent enough. Mm -hmm. But again, what we're noticing in all these assembly races is that the Democratic candidates are almost on their own in every example. 
uh, in terms of air cover from outside groups. Yep. They're relying on mail, yep. unions doing door-to-door -door contacts. The Republican candidates, usually they have their own, they have their own you know, TV and radio and or outside groups helping them as well. American Federation for Children is doing a lot of radio ads. Jobs First Coalition, uh, they're all, WMC is doing TV against a couple of the candidates. So they're getting much more ad cover. Is that a question of resources? Democrats don't have you know, pre-Act 10 union donations anymore to kind of dip into. Yeah. Or is it good strategy because in some of these districts, you have three or four or five radio stations that cover the whole thing. You, there's no one dominant format to go after. Is mail a better way to spend your money? Or is there a reality of you don't have much, so do what you can with what you have? I, I agree. There's another race that I, I find fascinating. A 85th Assembly District, a Democratic rep, Mandy Wright, a former uh, classroom teacher, mm -hmm. up against an ex, uh, former ex-prosecutor, Dave Heaton. And uh, people say Heaton started out very rough, but he's gotten better as a campaigner. He's working very, very hard. And here's the kicker. Mandy only won by 90 votes two years ago. Three-way race to also two years ago, uh, which you know, didn't help her a whole lot. A uh, couple of things there. Dems feel pretty good about her. Like she's really worked that district hard, um, that she's kind of fit in, if you will. A slight edge to her right now, but the kind of one of the questions is what environment will we see on election night? Will, will Walker do well in Wausau? Um, Democrats are more worried about Amy Sue and Stephen Smith right now than mm -hmm than Mandy Wright, but they're not like breathing easy saying, yeah, she's got in the bag right now. Okay, we'll talk about Steve Smith in a minute because I, I want to cover three more. Um, in the 51st Assembly District, it's an open seat because Mark Line is moving up to the Senate. Uh, Republican Todd Novak, mayor of Dodgeville, Democrat Dick Cates. Um, uh, Novak, longtime uh, newspaper editor, uh, uh, Recruited by Assembly Speaker Voss, yes. but Cates is a respected farmer, and his dad started a prominent Madison law firm. Um, what do you see happening? Open seat in which it's got a Democratic lean at the top of the ticket that would favor Cates. Republicans, though, have been feeling better about it until recently because Cates is being hit for not for missing school board votes in mail and radio. So they've been pounding on Cates, the outside groups, and Cates has re not been refused to go negative, if you will, or even do con they call them quote unquote contrast ads. Yeah. Uh, with Novak, but so they've been feeling better. All of a sudden, though, a story pops up this week right. that Novak had these two alcohol-related incidents in which the cops talked one, him out of driving driving home. When he might have been impaired. Called his neighbor. Look, uh, that was really tired walking around <laughs> where he was. Yes, uh, neighbor was called, who happened to be a sergeant. The police force came and picked him up, and then the other one, he was like, urinating on a building while he's out and about in town. I mean, those aren't great things. Here's the catch, though. It's a media story that hasn't hit into radio or TV yet. Will it? Because while it's out there, how much does it penetrate? You know, one broadcast story run one time. Um, it's not like it's gonna. It's fatal right now. But if it's hit heavily in radio, TV, a mail piece, that could really hurt Novak's momentum or his ability to win that seat. Okay. Yep. And let's talk about two more. The next one, as you said earlier, 75th Assembly District, first-term Democratic Rep Stephen Smith mm -hmm. and Romaine Quinn, yep. who graduated from high school and then became mayor of Rice Lake. Yes. Pretty interesting. And Quinn on his website says, uh, that no one family should have a lock on this seat. And I just want to read what he says on his website. For the last 34 out of 36 years, the 70, 75th Assembly seat has been held by the same two families. I see that one as pretty tight. Do you? Uh, Democrats acknowledge that's a very much a tough race. Republicans feel pretty because of the environment. I mean, that's a seat that leans Republican number one. Uh, Walker should do well up there. I mean, Roger Rivard, uh, if you remember, made a comment, some girls rape easy, or he's self, quoting his he, father. He's self-destructed. Yes. And Smith only won by 615 votes. Yes. Excuse me, go ahead. I mean, that's the thing. He self-destructed. Every Republican in Madison abandoned that guy, and he's only lost by that many votes in a presidential year with higher Democratic turnout. That kind of doesn't bode well environment-wise for Stephen Smith. Can he fight against the tide? Sure. but. That's going to be a tough race, too, for Democrats. Okay, and one more race, race I want to talk about. The 68th Assembly District, Republican Rep Representative Kathy Ber uh, Bernier against Democratic Jeff Peck. Uh, Bernier won with 1,276 votes mm -hmm. two years ago, but that was against a candidate who wasn't Jeff Peck, who is a uh, young farmer and fought in the uh, Iraq War as a, as a National Guardsman. How do you see that one? Two years ago, Democrats missed some opportunities in some of these assembly races because they recruited candidates who didn't fit the district. They, they maybe fit the uh, Madison message of like what they want to run on, you know, the, the, the kind of hangover from Act 10, if you will. But as far as like fitting rural districts, they weren't great candidates. Uh, Bernier's opponent was one of those. 
this time Jeff Peck, much more district friendly, if you will, profile. Yeah. Yeah. Now WMC's been hitting him hard because of his association with Wisconsin Farmers Union, saying that they want to jack up to all these like uh, global warming, thi warming things would jack up your gas prices and kind of portraying this as a, a radical organization. So they're hitting him hard. Bernier's problem is um, the district is pretty swing and she's voted pretty conservative. So it's not, she's not voting you know, with her future in mind, if you will. And that sometimes comes back to bite you. So she has some favorability issues with the district on some issues that you know, create an opening for Jeff Peck. But again, there's an example of a lot of TV on one side, none on the other. You know, can mail kind of carry the day? Yeah, and she's she's chairman of the Assembly Elections Committee, which I find interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, time to uh, for Wisp Politics stock picks, my friend. Uh, rising U.S. House incumbents. If you look at uh, FEC filings, there are only nine states in the country have had fewer independent expenditures in House races in Wisconsin. It's because our races aren't competitive. Then you look at the fundraising numbers, and those guys are out raising um, their opponents. You know, big time. Because again, there's not competitive seats. It's not a great environment. There, there are opportunities, if you will, in times like uh, Sean Duffy's seat, the seventh. It can be competitive. It's just not this year. Um, to, uh, for, in 2010, Republicans went to Ron Kind out in western Wisconsin. Horrible year for Democrats. Wave year for Republicans. He nearly survived. But they withdrew his seat, made it more Democratic. So even if you yes, had a wave did. year, yes, you know that he'd be in better shape. Plus, what's interesting about Wisconsin is. Nationally, all these house races are like a referendum on, on President Obama. In Wisconsin, it's a referendum on Governor Walker up yes. and down the ticket. So you're not seeing the, the national w uh, tide, if you will. How mm -hmm. big that wave is, I don't know. But the national tide isn't really hitting here. And the only theory I've heard is it's because it's about Walker, not about Obama. Okay. So you've got our seven U.S. House incumbents as safe, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, okay. Glenn Grothman's in very good shape to win, you know, that open seat. Okay. Mixed? Uh, you know, Brad Schimmel. The TV wars are heating up, uh, like we talked about before. He's got this first real attack ad from the Committee of Justice and Fairness, which, by the way, Schimmel went after that hard, you know, demanding it be pulled down because of a, mis you know, it was full of lies. And they changed one they won reference citation. to a legal case. Yes. Yeah, so far, as far as I know, it hasn't. Nobody's refused to run it. Now they changed the ad, but it's still up there, hard hitting, haps getting hit. Um, positive ads are flying. This race is really kind of heating up, like we talked about a few weeks ago. It's all about TV the last couple of weeks. Who can make the best ad, make the other side look the worst? And that's what's happening right now. Um, I don't know if that Kramer stuff will end up in this campaign at all, but there's a little issue there with that. This lawsuit over the tapes. It's, it's just getting nasty right now. And the, the question insiders have is, will it be a coattail race, i.e., will Walker win, Schimmel wins, Burke wins, Hap wins, or will there be some crossover? Will somebody go up for Scott Walker and say, you know, I'm not sure about this guy, but I can't quite pull it for you. I'm going to vote for Hap as a check, if you will. Or yeah. I'm going to take a flyer on Burke and give her a shot, but I want somebody to keep an eye on her. I'm going to vote for Brad Schimmel. To, you know, there are all kinds of theories up there about the what The old back happen. and forth, Tommy Thompson and Jim Doyle. Yes. Some people believe that that check and balance is but pretty effective. Look at 10 and 12. We didn't have cross-ticket voting. I mean, the, the I, differences between Johnson and Walker and Baldwin and Obama in those two elections were not very much, you know, were not huge. So kind of hard to see that a little bit because of that dynamic is developing. We're a very divided state, very partisan anymore that's in some of these elections. And that's what I'm, we're going to get into that a week yes. from today on the last rewind before the election. Falling. You know, Scott Walker, uh, the John Doe stuff this week, there's no smoking gun. Um, I talked to insiders on both sides. They don't see a game changer. But for two days, he's knocked off message as to talk about this stuff. Negative headlines. Oh, and by the way, last week when the Marquette poll came out, it was like, oh, no, there are problems with the sample. It's not that close. Now we get two more. Granted, they're automated polls from PPP and Rasmussen, which are kind of partisan organizations, but mm -hmm. they have it dead even. He's out there, you know, saying, hey, RGA, I need help. You know, we've got all this stuff going on. That was very interesting. On. The RGA, uh, send me money. Send money here. And, 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 and they're adding a million dollars. And he talks about Madison voters being angry. I mean, he's yes. still trying to motivate the base. Now, his, his last ad, some folks liked it, where he's making the closing argument of we're doing well on jobs, things are getting better. But he's still dealing with the 250,000 jobs pledge two weeks out from the election. I mean, I'm not saying Walker's going to lose. It's just that this was not the week you wanted. If you were going to create distance between yourself and your challenger, this wasn't the week. He may next week create that distance. He may survive narrowly. Yep. In, and the, I next, have, in, in the next and final Charles Franklin poll. And I have Republicans, uh, poll will be out next Wednesday, and I have Republicans who still believe that he's going to squeak it out. But Dems are like, hey, we're in this two weeks out. You know, 
after the plagiarism stuff that happened, we got a shot. Yeah, it's fascinating. And it just keeps getting more interesting, right? Yes. <laughs> and so turn into re Rewind next week. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. That's Rewind for October 24.